Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Michael Zuber, one rental at a time. And we are back with legendary investor and great friend of the channel, Mr. Jonathan Twomley. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great this morning. How are you, Michael? I'm doing very well. So our first topic of the day is a very interesting one. It's it's about those damn boomers, right? They uh, We're both Gen Xers and those boomers have been messing with our lives for, for so long, right? Forever, and for our forever. whole lives. <laughs> for our whole lives, basically, yes. Yeah, they've screwed everything, you know. Yeah, leaving a, 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 a path of destruction in their way. <laughs> exactly. So I thought yeah. we should talk about it because I'm actually starting to read articles about wealth, wealthy baby boomers kind of um, really messing with the real estate market. So uh, yeah. I think you've read an article as well. So I thought we should talk about that. So, so what are you seeing? Yeah. So just something, you know, this morning, interesting popped up on in my Facebook feed from Business Insider mm -hmm. and the headline it kind of echoes our sentiments. Wealthy boomers aren't just keeping millennials from home ownership. They're screwing up the retirement plans of the rest of their generation, <laughs> basically. So they're, these people are just a big problem, right? So, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so I tell all you, all you boomers <laughs> out there, I don't, don't, I don't mean this it, is a jest. It's just, I don't mean it personally against you, but, yeah. uh, but there is some generation. But all your neighbors. That, yeah. Not you, it's yeah. your neighbors. That's right. And, 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 and the, the cousins that you don't like. Exactly. Um, that, that guy is the problem. That guy. But, uh, that guy. So, but um, so here's here's what's interesting about this phenomenon. So, as you guys know, the baby boomers is just an enormous generation of people. You know, until the millennial generation, who are basically their children, the mm -hmm. biggest generation in the history of the country, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, a, a huge number of people like that is bound to have an impact on mm -hmm. on everything as they as they as pass, they age right yeah. as they pass through time like like the rat going through the snake, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the things, so they were, you know, responsible for, you know, the housing boom of the 1980s when they all started becoming, you know, home ownership age, mm -hmm. right? And right. responsible for the, the renter boom of the 70s when like, you know, a gazillion units mm -hmm. got built in the 70s because all those people needed to live somewhere, right? So right. that's, and- and so you, you've seen their impact on the housing market, uh, you know, continuously. Uh, and what is now happening is that the boomers want to downsize, mm -hmm. right? And you've now got a bunch of different things happening. So you've got this big generation of people who, a lot of whom want to downsize. They no longer need like the huge five bedroom house, right? Because right. the kids are the kids are all grown up and they move to wherever they've moved to right in that you know it's getting more and more difficult to maintain like a big house and stuff and they just they want to downsize mm -hmm. but as you know starter properties no longer get built right. right because the cost of construction is so high and zoning is such a difficulty that it just doesn't make sense for builders to build starter homes anymore, right? They probably, if you think about it, if you think about like the classic starter homes, like you think about like the Levitt towns of the world, like those older suburbs, mm -hmm. very small houses on very small lots, right? Kind of like cookie cutter. You probably can't even get that kind of density for single mm -hmm. family houses really anywhere at this point, right? Nobody, right. There's, like, there's like nowhere that will let you build that, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it means that you've got these bigger lots, bigger land cost, right? There's just more demand. The population has grown a lot since then, right? So the cost of everything has risen. So it just doesn't make any sense for, and this is even before COVID, right? This has been going on for a long time. It doesn't make any sense for developers to build small homes, right? right. Because it's just not cost effective for them. So they buy, they build much bigger homes, right? Mm -hmm. So what's happened is in 1980, so starter home is defined as a 1400 square foot or smaller house, right? Wow, that's, I haven't seen a four, a, I haven't seen a new construction home under 1400 square feet in, God, two, two decades? Yeah. I, don't think, yeah. I mean, what is the average home size now? I mean, there, there was a blip right after the Great Recession, after the financial crisis, when people were like, had kind of this PTSD about McMansions, right? That mm. they had all these McMansions that, that nobody wanted, right? And so there was this little blip where the average home size in the United States declined a little bit in the years okay. after the Great Recession. But, it's, but then it started climbing again. So it's, it's around like, you know, 
2,500 square feet or so yeah. now, the average house, right? And so, so 1,400 square feet, though, mm -hmm. used to be the standard starter home. And in 1980, 40% mm -hmm. of all new homes that were built in the United States were starter homes, 40%, wow. right? Yeah. By 2019, that number had dropped to just 7%. Oh, and we wonder why there's a problem. There's just right. no inventory, yeah. And so what you now have is this very limited number of starter homes and the millennials who are now starting to buy homes right? and baby boomers are both competing for those small homes. That is right? that is so weird, right? They're coming, baby boomers, or I'm sorry, millennials are aging into 31, which is the prime mm -hmm. age to buy a home. So they want them. But baby boomers are on the other end of that aging out of the McMansions looking to downsize. Yeah. Oh, and guess who has all the money? And guess who has all the money? And so, <laughs> and wow. so it, it's not just a problem, not just that the boomers are able to outbid out the up at the millennials yeah. but it's it's a subset of wealthier boomers mm -hmm. who are able to outbid everybody else all the yeah. other boomers too who want to downsize so now people are sort of stuck in these big houses that they don't necessarily want but they're afraid to sell because they don't know if they're going to be able to buy another house to move into right? that is really interesting because i've been thinking about that for a while now right there really is a a, a average path or life cycle of homes right First time homeowner, the upgrade, right? Maybe one more luxury, but then you go down. Mm -hmm. And right now it seems that that cycle is broken. And it, that, is, that is very interesting. So the guys that are in the big McMansions, they, a lot of them want to downsize, but they can't. It's right. weird. Wow. Well, and listen, and there's also things that I don't really hear people talking about this stuff very often, but there are, all, there are other dynamics that are also at play here, right? One of which is just simply like, the cost of land and where land is cheap, right? Mm -hmm. And if you think about, so the United States demographically over the last, well, basically since World War II, right? Okay. What happened after World War II? Well, you had this big exodus out of major cities into suburbs, right? Mm -hmm. Into basically into farmland. It was all, there were, I mean- It there was, was farmland, yeah. There were, there were a small number of suburbs that developed like after the civil war and, you know, kind of in before World War II, but now you know, we're thought of as the inner ring suburbs, right? And they were higher density. The houses were closer together, right? I mean, you guys probably in every town in America, you, you know, these suburbs are all wood frame houses. Yeah, they just, every, every house looks different, right? Fairly yeah. small. I mean, if you think about like, you ever see the movie, A Christmas Story, Yeah. right? Yeah. Like those houses in Cleveland, right? That's sort of, I mean, even some of these suburbs, right? Are actually, within the city limits yeah, right but sure. like so like where i live in brooklyn this was considered a suburb mm. right even though it's within now you know it was it actually it was i mean i don't want to get into the history it wasn't within the city of brooklyn originally eventually got annexed and then it got annexed in new york brooklyn got annexed into new york city but a lot of these neighborhoods were not actually part of the city at one okay. time if you look at if you look at boston like most of what we think of as boston today was not part of the city of boston until like the 18, late 1800s, early 1900s, and started mm. getting annexed into the city of Boston. So you saw that annexation process. So, but a lot of these places that people think of as the city are actually the original suburbs, right? Mm. So, and and that neighborhood in Cleveland, you know, that from um, you know, a Christmas story. That you know, that's so. But that's what we're talking about. But then, yep. so people started moving down. People are moving further out. They're buying now. Farmland is getting bought up by developers, right? And we mm -hmm. mentioned Levittown a minute ago. That's like a great. You know, sort of classic example of they just bought a huge amount of farmland on Long Island, you know, taking advantage of what the automobile, right? That right. was the thing. So people yeah. could go further, right? And so where were this where were the big cities in those days? Well, they were basically in the Northeast and Chicago, sort of Northeast, some parts of the Midwest and California, right? The South really didn't have much population after World War II, right? That that all that population growth has come since then largely due to well two things one is air conditioning mm -hmm. right and the other because before air conditioning like it was basically unbearable to live there right and and the second thing was uh the, the taft hartley act which allowed the southern states to become non-union states oh, right okay. so right right to work so before that uh 
before air conditioning and before deunionization, there was little incentive to move to the South. Okay. So after those things happened, you started having slowly, and then it kind of picked up a lot of momentum, people moving South, right? But so you had this phenomenon where up in the, nor in the Northern cities, all, all the kind of commutable distance got built up. And that process kind of continued even into the 1980s, right? Mm -hmm. As the baby boomers. So you had then the development of all the exurbs, we call them, right? That mm -hmm. outside the, the further rings outside the big metropolitan areas, right? But eventually that basically got all filled up. And when they built all those exurbs, right? The zoning just got big. Like every time they went out a few more miles, the zoning got bigger, mm -hmm. right? Because people wanted like, you know, they wanted a bigger yeah, a state lot. Lots and yeah, and they wanted, and the land was cheap, right? And so why not? Like, why not put it on five acres, right? Yeah. Because because you could, but then it got zoned or got restricted, you know, restrictive covenants or whatever, right? So the land got basically taken up pretty much to the point where it, it became not feasible to commute anymore. Right. And then, but the population kept on growing, right? And now the land, well, you're not allowed to build high density because it's zoned out, right? You, so basically now you've got land prices rising and rising and rising. That has, that is probably, you know, people complain about taxes and everything, but when you look at the data, the, the factor that is causing people to move from north to south, one is weather, mm -hmm. but the other is the cost of housing. Oh, no question. Right? Yeah. So really more than, even though taxes is what people complain about, it's really the cost of living, which is basically a, a housing issue. Mm -hmm. So people are moving south. But what you're seeing is the same exact phenomenon is repeating itself. It's just happening 50 to 60 years later in the south. So you see the same, this, the same process of these, you know, the rings around the cities mm -hmm. becoming developed. When they're developed, you know, everybody wants, everybody who moves into a new area, right? If you move into an area of single family homes, I mean, let's face it, NIMBYism, what that means is you mm -hmm. want it to stay what it is, right? right? So if it's like urban, you want it to stay urban. If it's suburban, you want it to stay suburban. If, you, if it's rural, you want to, you know, people, feel, it seems like in rural areas, people will feel a little less, a little more like about all about property rights, right? So yeah, mm -hmm. we can build what we want, but, mm -hmm. um, but the suburban lifestyle, like people, that's what they want and they don't want it to change. They don't want anything built near them, right? So that's, driving the cost of land up. So you're going to see the same exact phenomenon, you know, and then what happens is all the infrastructure that's required for all these houses, right? So roads, transportation, schools, police hmm. departments, all that stuff. How does it get paid for? Property taxes. Property tax, especially in states with no income tax, right? Yeah. Then, so then you're good, what you're going to, so you're kind of like in this golden window right now in some parts of the South where like the, the land cost is still fairly cheap and right. like the cost of all the infrastructure has not really been fully baked in yet. And like, but I, I, I hate to tell you guys, if you want to know what's coming to like Austin, mm. just look at, look yeah. at New Jersey. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. New Jersey is the future. All right. Yeah. And, and, and there's, and there's nothing you can do about it. You can elect all the Republicans you want. Like the, the, the money's, for roads got to come from someplace, exactly. right? And if, and if there's no income tax, it's going to come out of property taxes. And like, so, but this is the same. So basically this is the same phenomenon is happening everywhere. And with just the price of land mm -hmm. being pushed up by population moving to that spot. So yeah. first it was outside the big cities in the North. Now it's outside the big cities in the South, right? And so um, the only thing that's going to solve this housing crisis in my view where nobody can afford to you know because the land prices are so high and construction costs are so high uh you know to the only way starter homes are going to get built is if we just you know if nimbyism goes away and and i don't see that going away so basically you know unless government gets more heavy-handed and makes mm -hmm. it go away mm -hmm. which people are obviously very opposed to right that's mm -hmm. that'll be hugely controversial if if mm -hmm. government tries to like force this on people mm -hmm. so i think the housing crisis is here to stay uh, well, I, yeah i i agree uh, but every what i was what i was just thinking about as you were sharing that history lesson and basically saying hey you over there in the south look north for what's coming i was like damn if i was a real estate investor in my 20s i'd be going i'd be building a portfolio down there 
kind of on that maybe that first ring and then just let let the yeah. life cycle run that's that's from from your from that i was like well i know where i'm gonna go make money <laughs> well yeah i mean listen demographics are are, are, the are way investable that, yeah oh yeah yeah i mean these are like the long-term trends mm-hmm. that 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 you can you know as long as you don't you know grossly overpay for something or don't make the mistake of which i've seen people do right of mm of buying something that's costing them money out of pocket because they think they're going to get future appreciation and yeah, make it up. Yeah, that's called an alligator in my book, folks. Don't do that. Yeah, don't do that. Right? <laughs> yeah, don't but do if, that. You, if, if you have a very long view, right, and you don't necessarily need to have immediate cash flow, mm-hmm. right, as long as you're getting an asset for a price that, well, that you're covering your costs, right, mm-hmm. You can just let this natural process. Let it be a friend. Get thirty-year debt, though. Get yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Spread out your debt. That, I mean, that's part of making it affordable, right? But you can, you can just allow this process to to play itself out. Mm-hmm. Now, this is a lot easier for someone who's buying single-family homes than for someone like me, right? Because if I've got to pay an investor returns, mm-hmm. investors are saying we want X percent as a preferred return and blah, blah, blah. It becomes very difficult when prices are so high. But if you're just using your own money and you're, you, you know, every year you have, let's say, say you have a, a good job and you can invest, you know, 25 to $50,000 a year in mm-hmm. buying one more property. This yep. is, this is a path to- One rental at a time, baby, get to one four. One rental at a time. <laughs> yep. This is, this is a path to some It's, it's some a real wealth, simple right? path to wealth. Exactly. Yeah. Time in the market's better than timing the market. Yeah. For sure. so. But I also want to say that someplace like the South where you've got that population growth makes this, makes this very easy. Oh yeah. But, it's but, it's, but it's, but that it's putting the odds the only, in your favor. But that is not the only place in the country where you can do this right oh, no, now. Not at all. Like, like Sacramento, California, I just read the other day has got either it was like the greatest housing shortage in the country or now the highest prices in the country or something like, you know, and you've got where you live, Michael, Mm -hmm. there's been a huge influx of people. And as long as there is population, see, this is the thing, unless you're in a, there are some states around the country where the population is declining. Yeah. Right. But even within those states, there are places where the population is still growing. Right. And as long as you have population growth, Mm -hmm. this, you're going to have this phenomenon. Right, Agreed. because the, the the land, the people, the number of people is growing, and the land is not expanding, and you've got this refusal to allow anything to be built in I, in some of these places. You totally know? agree. And 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 ironically, the the places where it is easier, like say in the in the Northeast at least, mm-hmm. right? The places where it is easier to build, you know, which tend to be kind of like the 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 Republican controlled areas of the states. Mm-hmm tend to be too far away for anybody to commute, right? Yeah. So it, it doesn't really help that, well, okay, it's easy to build in, you know, Northwestern New York, but, or no, actually Northwestern, that's Buffalo. So you have the same problem. It's easy to, you could buy cheap land like near where we have our house, right? Mm-hmm. But nobody can, com- you can't commute anywhere from there, yeah. right? So it's, you know, and even uh, this whole thing of like work from home at the margins that some people may move, but basically like, you know, it's, that's not, I, I don't see this solving the housing crisis. Like for suddenly all these people are going to move to the countryside. Right. Like I don't, I don't see it. So, yeah. um, so as long as it's like within commutable distance to a major city, there's going to be housing pressure there. And yeah. you've also got the aging out of, you've got obsolescence too. Stuff is aging out. Right. So, uh, and that has to be replaced. So there's, there's opportunity, as long as you've got population growth, you can use this strategy, you know, the, the question is how, how rapid the appreciation is going to be mm-hmm. um, or how much demand there is. But as long as there is population growth, you're going to be able to, to, to utilize this. So you should. Yeah. You know? Very cool, John. This has been a lot of fun for topic number one. Where can people find you and get part of your world? Yeah. So a couple of places, if you would like to invest with me, go, please Google Two Bridges Asset Management and uh, fill out the investor form that's there. And uh, then we'll be in contact. And uh, the other way is my Facebook group which is called the multifamily investment community. So just search for that on Facebook and uh, you know, let me know in the questions that you found me through, through Mike's podcast and uh, you'll be all set. Thank you, Jonathan.